Gupta. Excellence is an art. One, by training and habituation, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. Namaste and good morning to everyone. On behalf of the SNK family, we warmly welcome you all to the prize giving ceremony for grade 10 and grade 11 of the academic year 2022 23 and the annual recitation competition for grades 11 and 12 for the year 2023 24. We would like to extend a very special welcome to some of SNK's most recent alumni. We have with us today students who have left school but are present here to receive their awards. Thank you for being here. We are delighted you could make it. Before we begin, I request you to please switch off your mobile phones or keep them on silent mode. Let us begin the ceremony traditionally by lighting the lamp of knowledge. I request Bhavisha ma'am, Sonia ma'am, Kajal ma'am, Tanvi Gol and Malav Zalavadia to come forward and light the lamp. I request the audience to rise. Satoma Satamaya, Tamasoma Yoga, Tamaya. Please be seated. SNK teaches us to strive toward a blend of aptitude, knowledge, and dedication, exploring our talents to the fullest and working with dedication to reach the pinnacle of our potential. That is our ultimate endeavor. Because as Essentians, we understand that success doesn't come from defeating others, but success is achieved when we surpass ourselves. Our school provides all of us with a myriad of opportunities to explore our talents, and the annual recitation competition is one of them. The preliminary rounds of the recitation competition have already been conducted, and today we shall present before you the finalists of the recitation competition. But before we do that, it gives us immense pleasure to introduce to our panel of judges. Ms. Himali Khira. Himali ma'am has been associated with TGES for the past 26 years. She holds a master's degree both in English literature and education, along with a few diploma and certificate courses. She's a lifelong learner. She believes that learning is a treasure that will follow its owner everywhere. She's innovative, interactive, and interdependent. She likes traveling, reading, gardening, and music. Her philosophy for life is to live and let others live. We welcome you, ma'am. <laughs> Ms. Bhavna Mulani. Bhavna, ma'am, has been an educator for more than two decades. 
with a diverse set of skills and a proven record in education, curriculum development, and artistic collaboration, she is a highly accomplished professional. Throughout her entire career, she has successfully collaborated with many educators to create graphic novels in various subjects, developed an integrated theme-based learning curriculum, and even contributed to the writing of a textbook. She currently takes classes for communication skills and grooming across SNK. We are delighted to have you with us today, ma'am. Ms. Sonia Vatlani. Sonia, ma'am, is an alumnus of TGES and has graduated with a specialization in finance from the reputed University of Westminster, London. Motherhood carved a new path for her, and she is now a certified parenting coach. She conducts corporate training for soft skills, as she firmly believes that soft skills are the need of the hour. She also conducts various programs for the holistic development of children. We're happy to have you with us today, ma'am. Ms. Ka Ms. Kajal Agrawal. Kajal, ma'am, is a graduate of the SNK class of 2013. She went on to study global business and economics in Hong Kong, Finland, and Singapore. She returned to India and co-founded a hospitality startup in Goa. An avid scuba diver and a backpacker, she is now settled in Rajkot and is an industrialist. She is also the creative head for the Rotary Dolls Museum in Rajkot. Thank you so much for being here today, ma'am. Ms. Bhavisha Vyas. Bhavisha, ma'am, has joined the TGS family this year as an educator for English and communication skills. She has previously served as an assistant professor at Christ College. Ma'am is also a news presenter, anchor, and interviewer at Archkel, along with being a professional compeer for ceremonial and corporate shows. Ma'am's field of expertise is English language training, and Ma'am is pursuing her doctorate research on international intelligibility in English. Thank you for being here today, Ma'am. <laughs> Audience, please welcome the panel of judges with a round of applause. Let us begin the first round of the recitation competition. I request the following contestants to come on stage. Parshva Doshi, Prathna Khaitan, Durva Doshi, Grishma Nathwani. Parshva Doshi will present a prose poem named On Good and Evil. Parshva Doshi. On good and evil. As one of the elders of the city said, speak to us of good and evil, he answered, of the good in you, I can speak, but not, not of the evil. For what is evil but good, tortured by its own hunger and thirst? Verily, when good is hungry, it seeks food even in the dark caves, and when it thirsts, it drinks even of poisoned waters. You are good when you're one with yourself. You're good when you're one with yourself, yet when you're not one with yourself, you're not evil. For a divided house is not a den of thieves, it is only a divided house. And a ship without rudder may wander aimlessly amongst perilous isles, yet never sink to the bottom. You are good when you strive to give of yourself. Yet, you're not evil when you see gain. For when you strive for gain, you're but a root that clings to the earth and drains its soils. Surely, the fruit cannot say to the root, be like me, ripe and full and ever giving of your abundance. For in a plant, the fruit giving is a need, as receiving is a need, the root. You are good when you're fully awake in your speech. Yet you're not evil when you're asleep and your tongue staggers without purpose. And even stumbling speech may strengthen a weak tongue. You're good when you walk to your goal firmly and with bold steps. Yet you're not evil when you go to the limping. For even those who limp 
even those who limp, go not backwards. But you, you who are strong and stiff, swift, see that you do not limp before the lame, deeming it kindness. You're good in countless ways, and you're not evil when you're not good. You're simply loitering and sluggard. Pity the stacks can't eat swiftness to the turtles. In your longing for your compassionate self lies your goodness. In your longing for your compassionate self lies your goodness, and that longing is in each and every one of you. But in some of you, it is a torrent that rushes with might into the sea, carrying the secrets of the hillsides and the songs of the forest. And in others, it is a flat stream that loses itself in angles and bends and lingers before it reaches the shore. But remember, let not him who longs much say to him who longs little, wherefore are you slow and halting? For only the truly evil, only the truly evil, ask the unclothed, where is your garment? And the houseless, what has befallen your house? Thank you. Ashwa. Ratna Khaitan will present a speech titled Complainers. Ratna Khaitan. The following are true stories. May 26, 2003, Aaron Radston went hiking, a boulder fell on his right hand. He waited for a few days and then amputated his own arm with a pocket knife. On New Year's Eve, a woman went bungee jumping in Zimbabwe. The cord broke, she then fell into the river and swam back to the land across crocodile-infested waters with a broken collarbone. Claire Chaplin was smashed in the face by a five-pound watermelon being propelled by a slingshot. The most amazing part about these stories is when asked about the experience, all of them smiled, shrugged, and said, I guess things could have been worse. So tell me, tell me you're having a bad day. Tell me about the traffic. Tell me about your boss. Tell me about the job that you've been wanting to quit for four years. Tell me the morning is a townhouse being burned down to the ground. Tell me the snooze button is a fire extinguisher. Tell me that the alarm clock stole the keys, see your smile jumping into 7 a.m. and then crash totaled your happiness. Tell me how blessed are we to have tragedies so small that they fit on the tips of our tongues. You see, when Evan lost his legs, he couldn't speak. When my cousin was assaulted, she was speechless for 48 hours. When my uncle was murdered, we had to send a search party to find my father's voice. Most people have no idea that tragedy and silence have the exact same address when your day is a museum of disappointments hanging by events that are outside of your control. When you find yourself flailing in a notion of, why is this happening to me? When it feels like your guardian angel put in this two-week notice two months ago and then just decided not to tell you. Or when it feels like God is a babysitter who is always on the phone. Remember, remember that we get punched in the esophagus by a fistful of life. Too many people die of dehydration every year. So it doesn't matter if the glass is half full or half empty. If there is water in the cup, drink it and stop complaining. You see, muscle is formed by repeatedly lifting things that are designed to weigh us down. Muscle is created by repeatedly lifting things that are designed to weigh us down. So remember, when the world around you crumbles, find the pieces which are still there and build a new one out of it. You do not have to focus on the ones which have already crumbled. The human heart beats about 4,000 times per hour. And each pulse, each throb, each palpitation is a trophy engraved in the words, you are still alive. You are still alive. Act like it. Thank you. Thank you, Prathna. Durva Doshi will present a prose poem titled, The Language of Equality. 
Durva Doshi. Once upon a time, there was a language that was only spoken by a few. The privileged were fluent, but the rest hoped to pursue. Ironically, it was called the language of equality, but the language never reached the true tongues and students it hoped to reach because the people who learned it didn't plan to teach. So, there was a rebellion. People threatening to create their own language, make their own music, reclaim their tongues. I'm not sure if you'd believe me, but it was women at the forefront who weren't willing to settle because it mattered. They knew. They challenged hypocrisy with books and pens, with learnings and questions, with words unheard, because they knew the language of equality was what they deserved. But now, it's been over centuries. People have come and gone, and with every loss of individual, there are stories we have lost. And with every girl that doesn't make it to school, we drown ourselves in may have beans and loss of potential too. How many more fatalities will it take for the glass ceiling to crumble and break, for the glass ceiling to disintegrate? You see, it took a well-read girl to get shot in the head to convince people to switch from bullets to pens, because with ink we get peace in pieces, because when we read, we reason and wonder why. It took violence and an almost death to change a world in low on morals. It took a young girl with immense intellectual wealth. When will the need to read reach more than the cream? When will the urge to learn be fulfilled at arm's reach? When we fill empty notebooks with stories we haven't heard, we adapt, transform the very definition of words. There will always be an empty seat in a classroom and a girl somewhere with a want to learn. And if we can't make those to meet, what have we really learned? What we have really learned, we need to unlearn. Education should not be something one has to earn. We must feed curious, hungry minds with the right food for thought and be mindful of all that we have consciously forgot. I once heard, if you teach a woman, you teach a family. But I believe if you teach women, you free a nation. It is time for this language of equality to no longer get lost in translation. It is time for this language, for the language of equality to become mainstream communication. It is time for this language, for the language of equality to set the base as the alphabets for the language of education. Thank you. Thank you, Durva. Grishma Nathwani will present a prose poem, The Drowning of Icarus. Grishma Nathwani. Falling is the easy part. As Icarus plummeted from the sky, the only remains of his freedom being the harness, he threw his head back and laughed. He had reached for Apollo's hand and grasped thinning oxygen instead. When it is your love that kills you, no destruction is more lovely than that of the self. His skin alight with righteous fury, he can't help but wonder if this is his punishment for loving someone much brighter than he is. If he's condemned to burning alive forever, melting wax, warping the supports of his wings, until they too are now unrecognizable to the untrained eye. After all, there are only so many ways to describe being destroyed. Icarus landed in the sea. When he hit the water, the breath was ripped from his chest. Had he known he wouldn't take another for eons, he would have memorized the way his ribcage imprinted itself on the underside of his skin, expanding the cavern inside well beyond infinity. You never realize the luxury of breathing until you can't anymore. Even gods need sleep, and he is no different. He dreams of water now. It devours him as he struggles, limbs bound by sunbeams. Liquid churns around him as it configures itself into ichor until he's gasping for the breath he no longer possesses, drowning in everyone's blood but his own. He wakes up thrashing and pretends the disappointment of living doesn't reside in his throat. He is half mortal, after all, and that is enough to keep his anatomy from collapsing into a supernova. When he lets himself indulge in such thoughts, he remembers Apollo's eyes, his golden curls, Betrayal like that is not an easy thing to fix. 
yet his love had never become tainted by it. He expected hate to leak from his paws like the ichor he continues to suffocate in, or even fear, but neither flood his anatomy. Even now, the memory of the God's smile erupts something warm inside his chest spreads it like molten ash through his veins, and he mistakes it for scorching wax and smothering heat more often than not. He spends millennia buried under miles of ocean and sediment, and it reminds him so much of the sky that he weeps for decades. He is sure the seas comprised more of his tears than of water. He tastes the salt every time he opens his mouth. The coral has become his own personal crucifix, his two scarred palms, the martyrs. When Icarus dragged himself, wailing from beneath the waves, he had become nothing but a moral lesson. Don't fly too high, they'd say. Don't chase after something you'll never catch. The gods were long dead, but if you asked him, Icarus would swear Apollo's laugh still haunts him. Thank you. Thank you, Gurushma. Thank you, contestants. Today is not just a day when we celebrate our talented reciters. It is also a day when we celebrate the accomplishments of our students. All our achievements are influenced by three important factors. Our own efforts, the dedication of our teachers, and the blessings of our parents. All of us will agree that we owe more to our parents than words can ever convey. And so, it is our honor and privilege to invite the parents of all the awardees to present the students with their trophies. We will begin with the awards for academic excellence and honor roll for grade 11. The Academic Excellence Award is given for extraordinary performance in academics. The Honor Roll Award is presented to students who have met national standards of academic excellence. Students and parents, please come on stage as the names are called. I request the first group of students to come on stage. I invite the parents to come on stage. Ananya Dube, Ayushi Lodhya, Hetvi Kotak, Mishti Aghera, Priyanshi Mehta. Parents, please come on stage. I request the parents to receive the awards. I request the parents to confer the awards. Thank you, parents. Thank you, students. I request the second group of students to come on stage. I invite their parents to come on the stage. Twaj Noganvadra, Parshva Doshi, Smith Rupani, Vyom Shet. I would also like to invite Aman Udani and Malav Zalavadia to receive the award for honor rule.
I request the parents to receive the award. I request the parents to confer the award. Thank you parents, thank you students. I request the third group of students to come on stage. These are students who are receiving honor roll awards for grade 10. I invite the parents to come on stage. Ashi Parekh, Ashna Nadkar, Archi Somaya, Thruti Bhadukya, Ruan Shisha. I request the parents to receive the award. I request the parents to confer the award. Thank you parents, thank you students. I request the fourth group of students to come on stage. I invite their parents to come on the stage. Arsh Pat, Amai Patel, Aryan Patel, Dharya Chotai, Dhruv Poptani, Himnesh Babarya. I request the parents to receive the award. I request the parents to confer the award.
Thank you parents. Thank you students. We continue with the second round of recitation. I request the following contestants to come on the stage. Dia Madeka, Chuhu Varmora, Samyak Doshi, Asta Amrutya, Meghna Wala and Root Pandya. Dia Madeka will present a speech, Make Your Own Awards. Dia Madeka. Make your own awards. When you think about receiving an award from someone else, the last person that you would think of is yourself. Isn't it strange that the one person who knows how much effort you've been putting it, how far have you stepped from your comfort zone, and how much you've truly grown, is the one person who is the least likely to present you an award. In the past 25 years, rates of depression and anxiety in young people have risen more than 70%. And I think the cloud is to be blamed for this. So, what is the cloud? Well, in 2022 Winter Olympics held in Beijing, China, a young woman named Elin Gu won three free skiing medals, two of which were gold. And if that feat itself wasn't impressive enough, she had also clinched a prestigious spot in the Stanford University and is also a part-time supermodel. This holy trinity of achievements the mere age of 18. And that's when the cloud hit me. You know what the cloud is? It's that feeling that you get when you see someone achieve something great and you realize no matter how hard you try, you won't even come to lens close enough. And suddenly, all of the achievements that you've amassed over the years feels worthless. But what fun will be if we are to be little each of the steps that we take simply because someone else is improving by leaps and bounds? How miserable will it be if we are to dismiss the minor milestones that we erect along our journey simply because we are not awarded or complimented for it? Someone once said, there's no applause in the gym. But that's where the hard work is. And the good news is, it doesn't have to be that way. Celebrate your minor achievements. Treat yourself to an ice cream. Because when you go the extra mile, push on. Even when you feel like collapsing. I think that that's a moment plenty deserving of a pat on the back. And eventually, I think we'll begin to realize then the end goal was never a trophy or to be better than the person next to us, but simply to be a better person than who we were yesterday. The times where we show the utmost resilience, strength, and growth are ironically some of our most underappreciated moments. Times when no one else notices us, but they are undoubtedly the most important. So let us make our own awards and present them to ourselves. Because who better to give you an award than you? Thank you. Thank you, Dia. Chuhu Varmora will present a speech named Protecting Humanity. Chuhu Varmora. It was a quiet summer night the day I had a final glance of my home city, Damascus, Syria. The warm night breeze blew gently in my face as I gazed silently at its glow from the top of the Kwasian mountain. The city looked beautiful, and in that moment, I wondered if distance is better than chaos seems serene. You see, beneath my city's lights, beyond Syria's mountains and rivers, there was a system designed to steal from us, the people of my country, everything that made us human. 
Growing up in Syria, I learned that the walls of my home have ears, that anything I say will be heard by the secret police. As I was glancing at the lights of my city from the top of the Kwasian mountain that night, I realized one thing. Not everything is always as it seems. I knew that the glimmering lights from the top of the mountain did not depict the lives of the people on the ground. Only a few months before the night of my departure, I had been sitting with my then seven-year-old sister in the back of the car with my arms wrapped around her as the sounds of the bombardment filled the air. All I needed was a sky free of chaos. All I wanted was a place in which I could hide. At the entrance of the school I had been attending, it became normal to see tanks and soldiers passing by. And their presence signified everything but to keep us safe. The distant lights of the city from the top of the mountain were of houses that at some point had lost a loved one at the hands of an inhumane system of ruling. You see, it is crazy how much difference distance from something or someone or the lack thereof can make, isn't it? The thing is, we will never truly be able to learn something or fully become knowledgeable of it if we only look at it from a distance. We will never be able to understand the world in which we live if we only scratch the surface. What happens outside our doors? In Ukraine, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Palestine, or elsewhere is about all of us. It's about our humanity. When we worship, pray, or feel compassion, when we enjoy a painting, a sunset, or a sonata, when we think and reason, pursue ideas, seek truth, or read a book, when we protect the weak and the helpless, when we honor the noble and cherish the good, when we cooperate with one another to build a better world, our behavior is worthy of our status as human beings. Thank you. Thank you, Juhu. Samyak Doshi will recite a prose poem titled, I'm in love with this world. Samyak Doshi. Namaste. I'm in love with this world. One day, I asked my friend if he's ever been in love. And he says, I'm in love with this old woman who buys an extra loaf of bread for the stray dogs in our street. Sometimes she's so forgetful, she doesn't remember to eat. But she never forgets to feed them right before her afternoon nap. I don't know how she does it, but I think she's so beautiful. I'm in love with this little boy across my house, pushing himself into the front yard despite his crutches to teach his kid brother how to play football. I know he's in pain sometimes, but he's so happy, he doesn't care. I'm in love with that girl in school who learned sign language because she wanted to talk to her father better. And I'm in love with this boy I knew in college who paid compliments, not because he was trying to impress others, but because he was just being nice. And I'm in love with this old jogger I cross paths with at 6 a.m. every day. Because he's picking up empty water bottles that people left the night before. Because someone might step on them and hurt their feet, you know. I'm in love with this nameless stranger who bought a homeless a blanket for the winter. And the sweet lady who watered the flowers by the road. And the little girl who made her own lunch because Mommy was sick. And the people who smile at me even when they're running to work. The people between the little spaces where they find time to be a little kind. And I'm in love, I'm so madly in love with how the world is still so good and so mad sometimes. How kindness is sidelined and underrated because we're busy 
glorifying bad habits, romanticizing heartbreaks, sensationalizing crime, and glamorizing rebellion. Because our modern day heroes are men with guns, superwomen with glamour, stalkers in the movies, human gods that we don't see in the common people around us, whose biggest superpower is kindness, whose hearts are so big that you can fit into them. And maybe this is why it's so difficult to heal the world. Because good things don't come to those who wait. Good things come to those who look for them. And we're not looking for them. Finally, he shakes his head and looks at me sadly and says, what an irony. We've got eyes, but we don't see beauty. And beauty is humanity. Thank you. Thank you, Samya. Asta Amrutia will present a speech titled, A Feminist Manifesto. Asta Amrutia. Namaste. A Feminist Manifesto. In the recent US elections, we kept hearing about the Lily Ledbetter law. And if you go beyond the nicely alliterative name of that law, it was really about a man and a woman doing the same job, being equally qualified, and the man being paid more, well, because he's a man. So, in a literal way, men rule the world. And this made sense a thousand years ago because human beings then lived in a world where physical strength was the most important attribute for survival. The physically stronger person was more likely to lead. But today, today we live in a vastly different world. The person more likely to lead in today's world is not the physically stronger person. It is the more creative person, the more intelligent person, the more innovative person. And there are no hormones for those attributes. We have evolved. But it seems to me that our ideas of gender have not evolved. I know young women who are under so much pressure from family, from friends, and even from work to get married. A woman at a certain age who is unmarried, our society teaches her to see it as a deep personal failure. And a man at a certain age who is unmarried, we just think he hasn't come around to making his pick yet. We teach girls shame, close your legs, cover yourself. We make them feel as though by being born female, they are already guilty of something. And so, girls grow up to be women, who cannot see they have desire. They grow up to be women who silence themselves. They grow up to be women who cannot say what they truly think. And they grow up to be women who have turned pretense into an art form. The problem with gender is that it prescribes us how we should be rather than recognizing how we are. Today, women in general are more likely to do the housework than men. But why is that? Is it because women are born with a cooking gene? Or because over the years, they've been socialized to see cooking as their role? Actually, I was going to say that maybe women are born with a cooking gene. Until I remember that the majority of the famous cooks in the world, whom we give the fancy title of chefs, are men. I am a feminist. My own definition of a feminist is a man or a woman who says, yes, there is a problem with gender as it is today, and we must fix it. We must do better, and we can do better. We just need to believe that gender inequality can be diminished. We need to believe that a woman can f fly at par with men or higher than a man. Thank you. Thank you, Asta. Meghna Wala will recite a poem titled, Am I Too Old to Hide Under the Bed? Meghna Wala. Am I too old to hide under the bed? 
I'm stuck in a storm, but the storm is in my head. All I see is lightning, all I hear is thunder, just a boom coming one after the other. I once was blind, but now I see the blindfolds folds have unfolded from me. But try as I might to close my eyes and shut them tight and go back to black, to not knowing, to trust. Because now that I know, I know what I must do for you. I know what I must do for you, what you've made me be, and I'd give anything to wash it away. Scrub and scrub that dance spot out, but you can't wash off a tattoo because now you see I'm culpable too. I'm culpable too. I gnash and gnarl and gnaw until I'm raw, my vocal cords vibrating with vicious and vital truths that I need to speak, that you need to hear, my tongue undulating with the undue burden of silence. But the sound chokes back into my throat. The sound chokes back into my throat, a heart swollen lump, I swallow down. They say, mother knows best. But what if there are things that mother doesn't know? Like if she can braid your hair but still stand Scarlett O'Hara. You always say I'm your reflection but I can't hide behind your smile and from where I'm standing, we're on opposite sides of mirror glass. Me and you against the world? But the world is out to get me in ways you can never know or feel, so how can you know it's real? I am sick of suffering in silence. I am sick of suffering in silence. Today I will stomp and scream and shout until every word inside of me is out just by knowing, by seeing, that was my agreeing, my hands wet, once clean, dirty with sins, I don't mean words I didn't say, dragons I didn't slay. I inherit the sin and I become the monster that I was born from. Thank you. Thank you, Meghna. Ruth Pandya will recite a poem, Across a New Dawn. Ruth Pandya. Sometimes we read the lines in the green leaf run our fingers over the smooth of the precious wood from our ancient trees. Sometimes even the sunset puzzles as we look for the lines that propel the clouds, the color scheme with the multiple designs that the first artist put together. There is dancing in the streets again. The laughter of children rings to the house on the seaside. The ruins risen from the latest storms remind of ancestral wealth, pledged, purloined, pawned by an unthinking grandfather who lived the life of a lord and drove coming generations to despair and ruin. But who says our time is up? That the box maker and the digger are in conference? Or that? The preachers have aired their robes, and the choir and the drummers are in rehearsal. No. Where the worm eats, a grain grows. The consultant deities have measured the time of long-winded arguments of eternity and death. When it comes to the door, with its own imitable calling card, shall find a homestead resurrected with laughter and dance and the festival of the meat of the young lamp and the red porridge of the new corn. We are the celebrants whose fields were overrun by the rogues and other bad men who interrupted our dance with obscene songs and bad gestures. Someone said, an ailing fish swam up our lagoon, seeking a place to lay its load in consonance with its original plan, master. If you can be the oarsman of our boat, please do it, do it. I asked you before, once upon a shore, at home, 
when the sea front narrowed to the brief space of childhood. We welcome the travelers come home on the new boat, fresh from the upright tree. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, contestants. We continue with the prize giving ceremony. I request the fifth group of students to come on stage. I invite the parents to come on stage. Heer Babarya, Heli Patel, Pushti Rajanpura, Tanusha Poptani, Hussain Vora, Josh Sejpal, Kushal Radia. I request the parents to receive the awards. I request the parents to confer the awards. Thank you, parents. Thank you, students. The next award is the All-Round Excellence Award. This award is presented to those students who have shown excellence in all areas, academics, sports, co-curricular activities, and behavior. I request the following students to come on stage. I invite the parents to come on stage. Ayan Chauhan, Dhruvi Tilwa, Kashish Kheskwani, Rajjo Dawda. I request the parents to receive the awards. I request the parents to confer the awards. Thank you, parents. Thank you, students. We come to the most prestigious award for grade 11, the Outstanding Student of the Year in Academics Award. This award goes to students who have topped grade 11 in academics, 
for the year 2022-23. The outstanding student of the year in academics for the science stream is Yesha Ravani, and for the humanities stream is Dyuti Cheta. The most coveted award for grade 10 is the Student of the Year Award, which is given to students who have set high standards in all fields of learning, paving a way for others to emulate. This award for grade 10 goes to Hetvi Kotaria. I request the parents to come on stage. I request the parents to receive the awards. I request the parents to confer the awards. Thank you parents, thank you students. I invite our esteemed judge Hemali Ma'am to speak on behalf of the panel of judges. Namaste, and a very good morning to all present here. Really, what to say, because all the reciters have left us spellbound. It will take some time for me to come out of it. A huge round of applause for all the reciters. <laughs> I must say, all the reciters were highly impressive, but some of you were such flawless, we really could not come out of it and give you marks. In fact, there was no chance to cut even 0.5. So, through your choices and the confidence through which you have delivered your performance, makes you a winner by us. You have earned a reward for yourself. Another round for applause, because the way you performed is impeccable. <laughs> According to me, each one of you are a winner. The reason is you have come out of the comfort zone and gained the confidence to speak in front of the audience. That itself shows it's a growth. Students, please continue to do the same as and when the chance comes in. Grab the opportunity because such things will help you in future as well. I think that what to say is a big difficulty. In short, I would like to say that all the judges, we feel that we were in love with today's performances and the performers. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for your valuable feedback. And finally, it's time to declare the results of today's recitation competition. I invite Bhavna, ma'am, to felicitate the contestants 
of the recitation competition. Ma'am, please join us on stage. I invite all the contestants to come on stage. Parshvado, she wins the gold medal. Prarthna Khaitan wins the gold medal. Durvado, she wins the gold medal. Grishma Nathwani wins the gold medal. Diya Madeka wins the gold medal. Chuhu Varmora wins the gold medal. Samyak Doshi wins the gold medal. Asa Amrutya wins the gold medal. Meghna Wala wins the gold medal. Ruth Pandya wins the gold medal. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, students. Congratulations to you all. This brings us to the end of today's celebration. I thank the panel of judges and the parents of all the students for being here to share our joy and motivate us. A special thanks to the alumni present here today. We hope you have enjoyed being back in school. Before we disperse, I request everyone to stand up for the national anthem. Assembly Saudhan. Janagan man adhinaya ke jaya hai Bharat bhagya vidata Punjab Assembly Vishram. Thank you all once again for being here. Have a great day ahead. Students are requested to remain seated while judges and parents exit. <laughs>